Next up, we're welcoming Dr. Scott Fleming. Uh, Scott works here at Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, he leads the branch that builds data search forms from all the, the different uh, space telescopes that we hold data for, uh, like James Webb and Hubble and TESS and Kepler and all those. Uh, he also leads a sonification software project called Astronify. So he's going to explain what is data sonification and how we can sonify astronomy data. And then at the end, there'll be an interactive game show uh, where you'll test your listening skills with uh, sonifications made from actual telescope data. So please give a warm welcome to Scott. Thanks, everybody. How's my volume? Good on the room and good online? OK. So yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm pleased to give a presentation about our work on sonification. And uh, normally, Jen would also be doing this with me, because uh, she's one of the core members, but she's pretty busy today organizing the event itself. So I'm, I'm flying solo, but um, it is a group project. Um, real quick, especially for people who are online, this is sonification. I will be playing sounds that are not coming from my mouth for once. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so if you are online, you may want to go ahead and plug in some headphones if you haven't been doing it lately, just so you can get some good sound quality. And if you do, a reminder to make sure that after you plug in your device, that you make sure that the WebEx in your computer knows that that's the device you want to use when you um, plug in your, your, your uh, headphones. All right, so the agenda for the presentation. I'll first tell you what sonification is. I will then uh, motivate some of the reasons why we want to use sonification in research, including astronomy. I'll do a brief introduction to the uh, tool itself that we're creating called Astronify. There are other people who are doing work in sonification, quite a lot actually, but um, I'll, I'll talk about our own participation. Then we'll start uh, doing some uh, sort of uh, examples using, as Jen said, real telescope data with real alien planets orbiting other stars and using sound to interpret the data. And then I'll play some additional ones, and your job will be to count how many times that planet might have crossed the surface of the star. And we'll see how good you do. So that's the outline and the agenda for the presentation. So I'm going to start off by explaining what sonification is, and we're going to do it in a really interesting way by telling you what sonification is not first. What sonification is not is sounds that are produced in nature, where the sound is the data. So what I'm showing on the screen right now in the upper left is a picture of a tube on a tripod sitting on the bottom of the ocean. This is called a hydrophone, and ocean scientists use this to record sounds. Sound travels really well in water. They can actually detect things from many, many, many miles away. And they are recording sounds to study all kinds of things, like geology events, uh, animals like whales and dolphins and, and the songs they make, um, earthquakes under the seabed. But in this case, the sound itself is the data the researchers are gathering. So this is not sonification. Closer to home, uh, another great example is beautiful spring day outside today. You open your window, hopefully you will hear some birds. Bird songs are another example of uh, uh, where the sound itself is the data. Bird songs by themselves are not sonification. Uh, on the upper left, I have a picture of four researchers in the field, and they're holding various recording devices because the data they are gathering is sound itself. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Good. So, what is sonification then, Scott? Um, sonification is using sound to represent other types of data. And we have a perfect example of this we've been, we're, we're, most of us are familiar with for a long time. If I show you a picture of the United States and I colored it red and blue and yellow and orange, and I asked you what part of the country is hot today, without telling you numbers, most of you would be able to give me the right answer because we are used to seeing colors used to represent temperature, which is the actual data, on things like weather maps. So this is an example where on television, uh, people have decided to use color to represent some piece of data, temperature specifically. Now, you could also, and you should, but we don't enough, use other things to represent the temperature measurements, including sound. So for example, you could imagine a map of the United States that has uh, colors like red down in Florida and blue where I'm from in New England. 
Um, and it would also, when you moved your mouse or moved your finger over it, play a sound. Maybe it plays a really high-pitched sound when it's hot and a very low-pitched sound when it's cold. You're using sound the same way you're using color to represent temperature in this case. And you're making it more accessible because people who are colorblind or can't see at all, this color map is useless, but the sound is. Even better, if you can uh, experience both, it reinforces things. Oh, it's red and high-pitched. That means it's hot. Also, I know that red is hot when I hear, when I hear a high pitch or, and or see the color red. So when it comes to accessibility, the answer is almost always do more things together. It's always better. <clears throat> so that's what sonification is. Hopefully that made sense to people. So why do we want to use it for research? There's a couple of reasons why we want to do this. First, the human ear is actually way better at detecting small changes than the eyes. Typical human ears can distinguish over 1,300 different frequencies of sound, and you are sensitive to changes at the microsecond level when it comes to sound. So that's one one millionth of a second. People are sensitive to those changes, whether you might not appreciate it or not. Human eyes, on the other hand, <clears throat> um, are limited to about 100, uh, changes in one in 100, so substantially less sensitive. This is one of the reasons why television and monitor companies are not making 1,000 frame per second and million frame per second monitors. It's expensive, and also you don't need it, despite what some video gamers might claim. Uh, you don't need that level of FPS because your eye is simply not sensitive to changes much faster than uh, a change in 100 uh, frames per second. So it's, here, ears are very sensitive to detecting changes. And in astronomy, like many sciences, things that change are often very interesting in what we're looking to do. Another example is complexity of data. So what I'm showing right now on the screen is a chart, a graph. You can imagine a grid, a grid of graph paper. And a simple example would be to say, hey, I want to uh, measure the age of a baby as it grows. And so uh, I want to measure every month how much this baby weighs and make sure it's growing in a healthy way. And most of us and most students, once given basic training, could make a simple plot of, oh, hey, every month the baby started at maybe seven pounds and now it's up to 12 pounds and stuff like that, right? And you could make a point and then make another point on your graph paper and draw a line and that's your data. And it's pretty easy to represent. It's also, by the way, fairly easy to sonify, which I'll show you examples of later. What if I want to measure the height and the weight of a person as they age? Well, now I have three things I want to keep track of simultaneously. I have to use three dimensions to do this in. Now, the good news is that you can do this. Humans can actually see in three dimensions turns out. And so um, it is more complex, but you can make a graph where you use all three dimensions, you know, height and width and depth, and you can make, uh, uh, you can find out where a given measurement falls along all three of these uh, axes and make a chart. And what you come up with is a cloud of points. A little harder to interpret. You might need to be able to do things like rotate and spin around your plot now to see what's really happening, but you can do it on the web, you can do it in virtual reality. There are ways to explore clouds of three-dimensional data points. Okay, so far so good. What if I have seven, or in the case of astronomy where you're studying cosmology, you might have like 27 different parameters you want to try and visualize at the same time. Ain't going to happen <laughs> because um, we can't see in four dimensions or beyond. Uh, if you can, raise your hand. I have questions for you. Um, <laughs> so um, instead, if you want to stick to the visuals, we're forced to do things like represent these different data sets with even more properties of the data points I'm trying to plot. So for example, I'm showing another chart, but this time instead of having just black little circles where I make measurements, now I have to do things like say, OK, I'll use different shapes or different symbols to represent whether you're a teen or a middle-aged man or an older senior citizen, and then I'll use the color to represent something like your temperature of your body, and I'll use the size of the shape to try to keep track of your blood oxygen levels, and it becomes a mess very quickly um, to try and represent this visual. Sound, however, is inherently multidimensional. Um, you can uh, change lots of properties of sound, and uh, we are all very equipped to be able to sort of um, understand and, and synthesize those differences. I'm not saying you'd be able to understand 
uh, sonification of complex data set without training any more than I can ask a first grader to tell me how the stocks are doing. They don't know how to read graphs yet. They'll teach that later in school. But with training um, or experience, things like changing pitch and tone and the type of sound I make and 3D audio, I can change whether this is coming from the left or the right of the room, up or or uh, on the floor, back or forward. We've all been to movie theaters with good 3D surround sound systems, right? You understand how that can be used to represent different properties of your data inherently. So sound can be used to understand and look for analysis of highly dimensional complex data sets. And the last one, and the most important in, in many cases, is accessibility, right? Um, if I showed you uh, charts, um, they're not accessible if you can't uh, you know, see the screen, but if I include sound with the charts, it makes analyzing and interpreting the data more accessible. And as you heard earlier, there's no good reason why astronomy has been a visible um, uh, science other than just historical bias. Um, we are many, many decades or centuries beyond someone going out in Europe, funded by some king or, or whatever, and taking a telescope and looking at a star and saying, that's bright. Uh, it's, it's, it's this bright. Uh, give me a prize, please. Um, most of the data we analyze are actually not in optical wavelengths. There's lots of good physics reasons for that. JWST, for example, is looking in the infrared. Um, lots of space telescopes observe in the ultraviolet, which is usually blocked by Earth's atmosphere for good, re good reason, thankfully. We don't get uh, horrible cancer because of that, but it makes it difficult to observe in the UV unless you go to space. Um, and no one can see in those things, right? None of us can see in the ultraviolet or the infrared. If you do, again, I have questions for you. Um, so we, we can and should include other ways of interpreting this data beyond the historical ways of taking a picture and looking at it and trying to make um, measurements based on it. So that's the motivation for using sound, in particular using sound with and combined with other uh, devices like haptics and visuals. So I'm gonna show some examples uh, of sonification using the tool that we have created here at Space Telescope called Astronify. Um, and we're gonna start off not by using astronomy data at all. Don't worry, we'll get there. But it's important to ground ourselves and set some expectations. So I'm gonna play for you a couple of sonifications that are based on simple shapes to give you a sense of what the sound looks like before we look at real data from stars. So Astronify is an open source Python package. It was a roughly year long project funded by Space Telescope for our team to work on and now we're sort of working on it on the side. It is open source, it's on GitHub. Um, and what it does is called pitch mapping, which is a fairly simple concept. If you have, uh, again, going back to the graph of the baby and how it's uh, changing its weight over time, if you made a graph on graph paper, what, it, what the sound uh, software does is it takes a data point uh, one at a time, and it turns your measurements, seven pounds, nine pounds, 12 pounds, into a different sound. So you could imagine one way of doing this is to say, hey, as the value that I'm measuring, weight of a baby in this case, goes up, I could choose to make the sound rise in pitch. I could do all kinds of other things. I could make it go down in pitch. I could use different types of sounds. I could make it wobble. There's lots of choices, but that's an example. So what the software does is one at a time, it looks at the measurement and makes a sound and then makes another one and another one. And it's all customizable. So you can change things like how long each sound is played for as it goes from point to point. Um, you can also change how fast it plays each data point, um, as well as properties of how it maps the values into particular types of sound. That's the basics. Make sense so far? All right, let's do some real sounds here. And this is where we're gonna test our AV uh, capabilities. Oh, before I go on though, I do wanna give a shout out to the team. Um, Jen, our designer, uh, big shout out to her. Uh, Clara Brasseur, who was at Space Telescope and is now uh, studying a PhD in astronomy at uh, St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, they might be online, I'm not sure. And myself and uh, Kate Meredith from Geneva Lakes Astrophysics and STEAM was our education and outreach specialist. And uh, this really couldn't have been done without all of their uh, hard work and dedication. Okay, so we'll start off with a simple example. I'm gonna play something like, I don't know, 24 or something measurements and this data is boring, 
because it doesn't do anything. It's the same value over and over again. But you'll get a sense of sort of what I mean when it says it's going to play one sound per data point. So you should hear something like 20 some odd sounds, and they will be played with a small overlap between each note. So it'll be sound like a continuous sound, but you should hear a little bit. Okay, well, let's give it a try and see how things go. So you kind of heard a little bit of wobbling. That's each note playing right on top of the other one, and it was more or less the same pitch each time. Make sense? Now I'm going to make a little more interesting sonification. Here I have some values, about 24 again, or some odd number of them, and they're going to be changing from low to high in a constant steady step. So this is basically a diagonal line of data points, if that makes sense. So think about, and, and, and for this sonification, I've chosen to make it so that as a value increases, the pitch goes up. So if you hear a higher pitch, that's a higher value. So let's see what this listen, uh, listens like. So, oh, sounds like something's incoming, right? <laughs> but it gives you a sense, right, of what the data is doing. In this case, it's steadily increasing in value. And there's some usefulness there. Next shape I'm going to give you is the top of a triangle. And before I play it, I want you all to think about what does the top of a triangle look like? Imagine yourself with your eyes closed, you know, feeling the top of a wooden block that's a triangle, and knowing what the uh, previous example was uh, sounded like, that constant rise, what do you think the top of a triangle sonification should sound like? And then I'll play it in just a second and see if that matches what you might intuitively expect. Okay, so here we go. Top of a triangle, roughly the same number of data points. Up and down, like you might expect, and constantly increasing pitch in both directions. So the last example I have is the top of a circle. And again, imagine what the shape of a top of a circle feels like, what it's doing, uh, you know, geometrically, and what the triangle sounded like. And think about how you might expect the soundification of a set of data points that has that shape might sound like. So here we go with the last example. Everybody hear a difference between the triangle and the circle? If I play this again and asked you which one's which without showing you a plot, I bet you most of you could get which one's a triangle and which one's a circle, right? The circle sounded more gradual as it rised, and at the middle of the circle, like the shape itself, the sound is not changing as much as the triangle did. So that's the basics of sonification using simple shapes. OK, let's go to space. Um, now I'm going to show some sonifications of real data. The concept's the same. What I showed before were a collection of data points that just had arbitrary values that made shapes like triangles and circles. What I'm showing you next is actual data of brightness measurements of stars as a function of time. This is called a light curve. This is something that a lot of astronomers do a lot of times going back to that old European astronomer staring at stars and measuring how bright they are, it's a fundamental aspect of what it means to do astronomy and understand objects in space. What we do usually is measure the brightness of an object, and we can make a chart. Because again, there's only two things involved here. There's how bright is, it, is the object, and when did you observe it? That's what I refer to as one-dimensional data. right? Going back to the example of the baby and, and its weight over time. I have to make a mark on my graph paper of how bright the object is and when I observed it. And that's it. There's only two, prop, two parameters here. And normally what we would do is make a chart. We might connect those lines and make what's called a light curve to study how the star is changing or not over time. And this is what we want to sonify. So what I'm showing on this plot is a chart of a real light curve from a telescope called Kepler. Uh, I don't have the data points on the plot, but they are there. I just didn't bother to draw them in, okay? All you see is the line on the plot. And to describe the shape, um, this particular object starts off with some value of brightness, and it very quickly gets very bright, very sharply, and then gradually over time begins to fade. And at the very, very end of this particular set of observations, uh, the star brightens just a little bit, a little bump at the end, and then goes back down again. 
So that's a description of the shape. I'm going to play the actual sonification, doing the same trick we did with the shapes, but this time applied to real data of a star. Okay, so that's what a Kepler light curve sounds like. Not literally, again, we're not measuring sound, no sound in space, not really at least in most, most cases, um, but we are using the sound to represent what the data points are doing. If you were really careful, and I'll see if I can play it again for fun, at the very, very end, see if you can actually detect that second bump toward the very, very end of the light curve. Let's see if I can play this again for everybody. It may or may not be possible with, here we go. A little wobble at the end is that little bump that you kind of see on the plot itself. Um, so that's some real data. Um, it's really important because some of these space missions like TESS, which is flying right now, it's orbiting the Earth, and it's staring at stars to understand how they change and uh, how things like extrasolar planets, the stars themselves, asteroids, black holes, how do all these things change in brightness and what are the physics behind them? Um, so this is a very common data set that lots of astronomers use and analyze. We've heard exoplanets before. Thankfully, our Office of Public Outreach friends did a little bit to explain what exoplanets are, but it's pretty simple. They're basically planets that are orbiting any star other than the sun. So these are quite literally alien worlds. Now, I grew up when I was in, uh, what is it, junior high school in 1995 when uh, the first real exoplanet uh, orbiting a star like the sun was announced. So as early as 20, 25, 30 years ago, we still didn't have any real direct evidence that there were planets outside the sun, solar system. Now we know of thousands of them, and we're starting to do stuff like understand what they're made out of, um, what their differences are compared to planets on our own solar system, and of course, ultimately try to search for the presence and, and frequency of life, whether life is common or uncommon, and whether we might be able to find any one day. So one of the ways we can try and find these planets is to stare at a star for a long period of time and measure very, very precisely how bright the star is. And if we wait patiently enough, we might be able to see when a planet that's orbiting that star happens to cross in front of the star in our line of sight to it, much like somebody walking in front of a projector in a movie theater. And they block some of the, cam of some of the movies. They say, down in front, you know? <laughs> um, in this case, we really want to see that because by measuring how much light is blocked and how long the light's blocked for and all kinds of other properties, we can actually figure out things like how big is the planet and maybe even what is it made out of if we can analyze light. And the shape it makes as it walks, or it doesn't walk, I'm sorry, as it orbits and crosses in front of the star is this U-shaped dip um, where it blocks uh, uh, different amounts of the star at first, and then as it goes through most of the star, it's blocking as much as it's going to block, and then at the end, it sort of orbits outside of the, um, of the star, and you have to wait for an unknown amount of time for it to orbit all the way around the star again, and then cross again. But if we see these repeated crossings, that can tell us that there's a planet around the star. The Earth takes 365 days to go around the sun once. That's called a year here. Uh, I know this is brand new information for all of you. <laughs> um, Mercury, uh, the closest planet to the sun, orbits around the star in 88 days. That's how long its year lasts. Um, some of these planets we're finding around these stars go all the way around and orbit its star in hours. That's how long a year is. It's unexpected uh, when we first were finding them and very different from what we have in our solar system. Other planets are so long that we haven't seen them come back again yet, even though I've been looking for a long period of time. So there's a lots and lots of different properties of planets. And this is the way we try to look for them. Now, you can make a plot and a chart of the star's brightness, and it makes a U-shape, like I said. Um, you can also turn this into sound, however, to help with your analysis and to make it more accessible. So what I'm showing on the 
slide right here is a plot of the brightness of a, a real star observed by the Kepler Space Telescope and a zoom in where uh, for a little while the star is sort of not doing much. It's as bright as it's going to be. And then about in the halfway point of this plot, there's a sharp sort of drop in the brightness of the star as a planet is crossing in front of it and blocking some of the star's light. And then it moves on its merry way, and the star goes back to its normal levels of brightness. This is called a transit. Um, so the data itself looks like the letter U, basically. Um, and there's a little bit of wiggles going on because the measurements are not perfect, and the star itself is changing a little bit. So it looks like a wiggly, ratty-looking U shape. What happens if we sonify this? So I'm going to make the same um, sonifications. Uh, brightness... Uh, as it decreases in brightness, I'm going to make the sound drop. That's my choice. I could choose other things, but that's the way I'm going to do it this time. And let's see what this sounds like. So you should have heard pretty clearly the drop in sound as the brightness of the star dropped. And before and after, that's sort of its default brightness. Um, as I mentioned, what we really want to do is look for repeated dips because that tells us for sure that something's orbiting and the more we can watch it, the better we can measure its properties. And so this is another example of a light curve. Um, this is about nine days worth of data um, from the Space Telescope. Um, and there are three events, three times that a planet orbiting the star blocks some of the light. So what I'm plotting in this graph is sort of a more or less constant level of star brightness. There's a little bit of a gradual drop, but at three distinct times, roughly equally spaced, there is a drop in brightness caused by a planet blocking some of the light, the same planet each time. Um, the difference of um, how long it takes for it to come back again tells us how long the year is. So in this case, uh, the, the planet itself goes all the way around its star in about four and a half days, which is pretty darn short compared to the Earth or Mercury, but not too uncommon for a lot of stars in our, in our galaxy. So let's listen to the sonification and see if you can hear those three distinct dips, those three distinct transits. Here we go. Everyone hear those three dips? The first one was pretty early on. Um, so that's what we're sort of um, using for sonifications in this example. Did anybody also hear, it might be a little hard, but the gradual overall decrease in the pitch? Yep. So on the graph itself, you can sort of see by eye that, oh, you know, it's not exactly perfectly flat. The star itself is sort of gradually decreasing for other physical reasons. Um, so it's interesting that you can maybe hear that again. Um, all right. So, who's ready to do some interactions? <laughs> All right. So, you'll be listening to three more examples of real data from real planets causing these uh, dips. Your challenge, as you listen to the sonification, is to count how many transits occur in each sonification. And I'm not going to show you the plot the first time I play this out, in case anyone wants to try and cheat. <laughs> Then, after everybody has a chance to count, I will show you the sound and the visuals together um, so you can kind of see how that maps, okay? Um, and then if you want to online, feel free to, if you can find the chat, if you want to put in guesses in the chat, feel free to. Here in the room, if you want to hold up your fingers or just shout out how many you think there are, feel free. If you don't want to, just keep it in your head and see how good you do, all right? So here we go. First, real transiting light curve data. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to remind everybody one more time of what we're expecting to hear. So this is the same one I showed before, uh, the nine-day uh, light curve with three transits. We'll listen to it one more time to make sure you all sort of are grounded in what we expect, and then I'll show you the mystery ones, okay? So one more baseline sonification. One. Two. Two. Right? That's an example. So, new data. Here we go. I'm going to play a few sonifications. 
Question, uh, sonification number one. Want to hear it one more time? I'm just, I got a bunch of hands up, but I think the right answer. I didn't do it on purpose based on how many fingers you have, but <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. There are, in fact, five distinct trans. I got you. Yep. Five. How's the chat doing? You getting good numbers on the chat? Nice. Uh, there's one, five, or six. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's tricky. You're off. You can sometimes be off by one. I'm cheating a little bit because normally you would go ahead and listen to this probably two or three times before you answered, especially before you have a real familiarity with what sonification means. But you did a great job even with just one guess. So we'll play it again. Here's the actual plot of the data. Um, it, it, it looks like many of the other ones uh, where the star is hanging out of some brightness and there's five big dips when this planet's blocking it. Um, you also notice, for those who are looking at the plot, about halfway between each big dip is another smaller little dip. A little hard to see, but you might be able to see it. It's much, much, much smaller. I'd say it's like 100 times less, less deep than the main dips. But this is a real effect. This is actually the planet itself going behind the star. And the telescope is so sensitive, it not only finds out when the planet blocks some of the starlight, it also can detect that, hey, you're missing something when the planet goes behind the star. And that's the actual planet itself not adding to the overall light while it's behind the star. That's called a secondary eclipse. Um, so if you're really, really careful, you might be, might be able to hear that second little dip that happens halfway between each of the bigger dips. So let's play this again one more time. Here we go. So those are those five dips. Again, your mileage may vary with the really tiny one, depending on the quality of the speakers in the room and your ability to sort of interpret low-level noise. If you had really good headphones uh, and you had some practice, I bet you you could pick up that, that fainter signal as well. OK, a, a more challenging one. You're not going to be able to use one hand for this one. I'll give you that much as a hint, OK? So keep the counts going. Here we go. I saw some 19 hands. Anybody in the chat guessing 19? Wow, you're good. Indeed, there are, I think, 19 transits in this light curve. So again, the star is hanging out. Notice that little smaller dip in between each one. That's, again, a real effect. Um, and there are actually 19 transits. If I told you this was the same amount of time, and knowing what I tried to explain about how the interval determines the orbit, is this orbiting closer or farther away from the previous one? Closer. closer, because it's happening that many more times, right? So even that basic fact tells us that this orbital period of this planet is much, much, much shorter than the previous one, right? So let's listen, listen to this one more time, this time with the visuals, and you can make sure you double check my math and I have 19 correct here. example we'll move towards. This is another transit and um, I'll go ahead and play it and then while you listen to it, I might play it twice, um, there's, a, there's a unique little thing that happens toward the very very end and I'll see if I can quiz you all about what might be happening there. So listen very carefully to this one while you count the transits. Here we go. Want me to play it again? Yeah. All right, here we go. I'll try to play it one more time. Uh, let's see what the best way to do that is. Let's do this. OK, 
Okay, first easy question. How many transits? Three. Three, yes. Chat got three? Oh, they haven't guessed yet. I'm sorry. Spoilers. <laughs> there are three. Anybody hear something interesting toward the very end? What did you hear? Wobble? That's right. There was a high pitch. You may have thought, if it wasn't real, that it might be a problem with our AV equipment. Don't worry, fellas. Not a problem with the AV equipment. We are good. Here's what the light curve looks like. There was wobbling going on. This is a real effect on the star. This is probably a, what's called a star spot, which is a cool part of the atmosphere that's telling us how fast the star itself is rotating, and this little cool part of the star, which is darker than other parts, are coming in and out of view. Then we have, so that's like a sine curve up and down, like wavy thing. Then we have these big dips. That's our planet that we really care about. At the very, very, very end, there's a spike. Really high pitched bike. That was that really high pitch you heard at the end. It went beep, almost like you were at a hearing test. Um, and that's one of two things. It's either a boo boo, and that's a calibration error, <laughs> or most likely, this is called a flare. Um, this is something that uh, I myself study. I study both this and this and that. Um, I'm a bit of a mess when it comes to what I like to study. Um, but this stellar flare is like an event where the star itself has these magnetic fields come together, and for a brief period of time, there's this burst of, of brightness. Um, and there's lots of interesting effects um, caused by flares and questions about whether planets that are really close to these stars might be habitable or not. The sun flares once in a while. You, some of you may have remembered in the, in the past when there's a big flare, sometimes um, it can cause problems with like GPS or... Um, uh, electronics, it causes the uh, increase in the aurora because of magnetic field interactions, and if it's really bad, it can cause block blackouts, which happened at least once in a recent past. Um, thankfully, the sun doesn't do this too often, um, but there are some stars of different types and ages that love to flare and, <laughs> and cause a bit of a ruckus, and some of them have planets around them, and we have big questions about what they might look like and whether they're good places to visit. So uh, it's really interesting, and I'm glad you all heard it. So I'll play it one more time, and this time, don't worry about the planets per se. Listen toward the very end, and if you didn't hear it the first two times, listen for that really short high pitch beep, which is the flare. Okay, here we go. There's the beep. That's the flare. And like I said, there are some stars that have flares all the time. They are beeping and beeping and beeping. So pretty, pretty interesting mixture of stellar physics and alien planets in one graph. All right. So that's the end of our game show. Um, if you had fun or you want to share this with your family and friends, um, we have some surveys online. They're in SurveyMonkey. They should be accessible. We've tested that. And um, you can listen to some more examples and test your ears or your friends and colleagues' ears to see how many flares and planets you, you can find in the data sets. And some of them are much, much harder than what I shared with you today. I gave you an easy introduction to counting these things. You all did pretty good. There are some that are much, much harder because the data is much, much harder to interpret. So have some fun with that. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, the uh, Astronify software or you want to get access to those surveys, you can find all the information on our homepage. Um, uh, like I said, the, the links to the source code itself uh, is available. We welcome contributions from anybody who wants to uh, grab a branch and, and, and do some work on it. Um, there are examples of how to Sonify your own data. Um, for astronomers in the room, I would love it if in the future when you give a PowerPoint presentation at a meeting, don't just show a plot of your spectrum or your light curve. Play it. And it will, it will slowly grow, I think, in our field to get used to that as a way of doing our business. And it will also uh, surprise you what you might find out about your data. Um, and like I said, teachers and educators, we, we'd love to hear how you might be able to use this in your lesson plans. Um, and then finally, like I said, you can join our mailing list as well. So you can get all that good information at astronify.readthedocs.io. That's astronify.readthedocs, D-O-C-S, .io. If you Google search Astronify, nobody has stolen our name yet. 
So you probably will find <laughs> our, our homepage as well through a Google search, and you can also contact me at any time. Thanks again for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm, I'm just curious what went into deciding what the instrument is, why that sound? Great question. That in itself is a choice you make when sonification. Our software is designed to do sonification for research purposes. There are other valid use cases of sonification for things like education and outreach and art projects that have more flexibility. We chose to use tones, which is why it doesn't sound like a real instrument, um, because we felt that would focus the attention on what the data is doing. And we also felt it would avoid biases because um, music has a lot of conscious and subconscious cultural interpretations, um, emotions, and even basic things like, hey, most of us are probably used to Western music. It's not the only kind of music in the world. Fundamental differences exist in just music. So if we use things like violins and horns and things, um, there's a danger of introducing unintended analysis purposes. But there are other groups who are using um, more like instrumental um, sounds to represent properties of the data. I think the jury's out, but that's the reason we chose to use tones, at least for the version of a strong find out. Great question. Hey. Hey, uh, it's Josh. Um, just curious, why when we hear the dips in the occlusions, do we continue to hear the tone? Continue to hear the so, tone. So the tone itself doesn't stop. I mean, what I would expect is for the tone to sort of drop down to be a trough. But instead, what we hear is we hear the tone continue through those troughs, but we also hear the low frequencies. I'm just curious why... Mm. Why that is? Is that an artifact of, of your sonification, or is that the way the graph is, is visualized? I think there's two answers to your question. First, in, in many cases, what's happening during that drop is a combination of the planet blocking light, but the star is also continuing to change um, because of the surface itself. And so there is some additional wiggling happening that will change what you hear. It's not going to be a constant flat bottom in most cases. Um, the other uh, thing to note is that there is some overlap in each note. So there is some intent, the way we decided to do this, there is some intentional sort of overlap between uh, previous notes and the next note. Um, and you're probably hearing that because the amount of time most of those dips occur is very short compared to the time it's not undergoing a dip. And so you probably are hearing sort of like the overlap and residuals of the previous notes, which were at normal brightness, then you heard the dip, and then it continued onward. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that, and there's obviously lots of ways to customize it. One of the reasons we did have some overlap is because if we don't do that, we get clicking um, happening in, this, in the sound when there's a gap between the notes, and we found that really distracting. And so we chose for these sonifications to have that overlap. Um, so great question, yeah. No such thing. But um, in the transit dips, why did the pitch change? So on the last one you showed, I think the first dip was. Ah, great question. Um, one of two things. Um, well, so the cause is because the overall brightness itself is changing. If it was a perfect, if the star was emitting 1.000000 exactly amount of light every time, it shouldn't. They were, and, and, then, and the dip was always the same dip. You would hear only two exact sounds, full, full brightness and not full brightness, and that's it. Um, what's happening there is two things. One, the overall pattern itself is not a perfectly horizontal flat line. It's changing. And that could be two reasons. One, we didn't calibrate the data perfectly. It happens. It's hard. Or two, many times, stars themselves, like I said, are changing for different reasons over different time scales. And so if I had to guess, most likely you, I'm mean, glad you heard that. That's really interesting. Um, most likely what's happening is that the star itself is over long time scales also changing. So you're hearing these, hearing these dips on top of like a gradual overall change. That's probably what's happening. Yeah. And that's probably real physics you're hearing and seeing. Sure.
Thank you. This is Margaret Carruthers. Um, so how, are you using this to do actual data analysis? Like, do you listen to your data in the car while you're jogging? <laughs> <laughs> Separation of work life. <laughs> It's a great question. Um, I, I, well, the easy answer is these days as a manager, I don't have a lot of time to do science, but I would like to because, um, again, it's, 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 it's an important part of analysis and requires like training, but I, I do plan to do that when I get back to looking at light curves. Um, um, so my, my hope is that um, myself and others will actually include this in their other sort of analysis works. Um, one of the things that we did was we actually went to the MIT team at MIT running the test mission. And they have a bunch of people whose part of their job is to look at all these light curves and try to find out which ones might have real planets in them and which ones might be false positives. And they do that right now by using a combination of a bunch of measurements they made with software and looking at a bunch of plots. And we said, hey, what if you included sound? And so we did a little demo of Astronify and got some feedback. Um, and uh, it was really interesting to learn what parts of the light curve they cared about and how we could use sound to augment and amplify that. Um, but yeah, my hope is that people would do this. Um, I do have a plan as well to make a test dot radio at some point because there are literally hundreds of millions of measurements of stars, different stars that have light curves. So I can make a radio station that played those sounds one after the other and you would not hear a repeat for like years. Because we have so much data, um, so that could be a fun citizen project at some point to make to make test dot radio. That's that is a thing that can happen. It's my dream one day, maybe. Question on the chat. Have you done stereo sonification or broad spectrum noise with frequency spectrum similar to how human ears would locate a two D position of a sound in front of a listener? That's a great question. We on our team have not explored that yet, but there are teams who are using stereo and three-dimensional sounds as part of their sonifications, in particular for images. So our sonification tool is designed for what I call one-dimensional data, so charts. There are teams who are working on sonifications of images, and there they are doing things like playing the left part of the image in the left speaker and the right part of the image on the right speaker. And that gives you a lot of good sense of where you are in an image. So that's a great question. It's something we'd love to explore when we have more time. For one more question. Uh, here, I think I saw your hand up for a while. Hi, this is Shane. Um, just curious um, about scales of things, like, as in like time scales or how, how different the tones would be. Like, how much experimentation have you done with that? Like, I'm thinking. You can hear a rhythm of something if it's a short enough interval, and if it's too long, you can be like, well, is that actually an interval or is it a consistent interval or not? Just yep. curious. That's a great question. Um, there's two factors there. One is the sort of overall, like, y dimen the vertical dimension of the values. How much are they changing? If I have a value that goes from one to a billion, I have to make sure I don't blow out your eardrums when I make a sound or I don't play a pitch that only dogs can hear, which would not be great unless you want to get dogs PhDs, which I don't recommend. Um, so the code itself tries to account for that by normalizing the data, um, but it would make it a little challenging if you're trying to do direct comparisons um, between things that you do want to play like sequentially, but they are changing a lot in their absolute dimensions. That's something we're trying to figure out how to do uh, well. The other problem we have is time. I played relatively short clips. Some of these measurements have thousands of data points. Even if I made each data point last half a second, you're listening like a minute or longer sound, and you're going to forget what you heard earlier. And so we're trying to come up with, in the latest version, what we call gists, which is like, hey, here's a big plot that has 10,000 data points. I don't want to listen to a five-minute tone. That sounds horrible, right? But I do want to get a sense of what the data is doing. And so we're trying to like break it up into pieces and play a short five second overall sound that represents the data to help with some of those problems. Um, you can only speed up these things so fast before you start losing detail. So this is all great questions and some of the challenges when it comes to making sonification that doesn't just sound good, it actually represents the real data. Big data challenges for sound. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Thank you everyone for your questions.